Hello everybody, a warm welcome to Wisdom from North. Today on my show I'm meeting the intuitive channeler Lee Harris. Now Lee's journey of channeling started in 1998, where he all of a sudden sat on the subway and heard a voice speak to him. Now ever since 2006 he has been working with us full time, he has helped over 1700 people in private sessions and he has traveled the world with doing lectures and workshops and he has even done radio shows and he's a painter and a musician as well. Now it's Christmas time and I have a lot of questions on my mind and I'm looking forward to meet Lee to have some questions answered perhaps. Hello Lee, much much welcome to Wisdom from North. How are you doing? Hi, I'm very good, thank you Annika. Thank you for having me. And I'm so glad, you know, I found you. I recently just discovered your work because there was this beautiful woman who contacted me on my Facebook group and told me that you were coming to Norway and that I had to check you out. And I'm so glad I did. And what I find interesting is that with my interviews, it seems like there is a synchronicity there because I just published an interview with a woman who was channeling Mary Magdalene. Mm. Yeah, and I just had a couple here, uh, two psychotherapists who have started ch to channel. And then you come along and you call yourself an intuitive and a channeler. And I'm thinking, you know, maybe that's a theme for this month that I'm going to really <laughs> learn about this. And I know that this hasn't always been with you. I mean, it started uh, in 1998. Can you tell us what happened and how you all of a sudden, you know, heard this voice or felt this presence? Yeah. Um, I was on the underground in London, so that's the tube, um, the tube train, and I was on my way to work. And I was sorting through all the thoughts in my head, as you do, you think about what you have to do that day. And I remember the, the, the very significant moment for me was this voice kind of came in from the left hand side, and it was very positive, very strong and very clear. And I think a lot of my own inner voices were negative. Uh, judgmental toward me uh, so it was very immediately something different and I was quite shocked and started having a conversation with this voice and I, I can't remember what the exact words were but it would have been something like I was thinking about something I wanted to do and thinking that it, it wouldn't work or and this voice would come in from the left and say no it absolutely will work you just have to be patient and take your time and I remember the first time it happened I was like <laughs> what is that? I've never, I've never heard this before. And then, of course, you go through several thoughts, like, am I going mad? Is this schizophrenia? You know, you kind of start having those thoughts. But luckily, I had, I had heard of channeling, and so I had a sense of it. Um, it wasn't something I was pursuing, and it wasn't something I was interested in doing for myself. I, I think I thought, it at that time, I think my mind told me it was some special thing that a few people could do and it, it should sure, surely be harder than the experience I was having. Um, but I just wrote questions for like four, four, five, six months before I told any of my friends that was what was happening. I had a few close friends who were also spiritually open um, and, and the answers were always just amazing. So uh, over time I started to understand that I had accessed a guide my guide, my guides, that was how I kind of understood them at the time. And so I, I learned from them and studied. And um, then after a while, started doing sessions for my friends and people who knew me. And then after about another seven years, a friend of mine who was a shaman and a healer, who I helped with the channeling one day when we were at coffee, she said, you've got to do readings for people. I didn't think anyone would come. A lot of people came and kept coming. And that was kind of how it all started. But this voice that you heard, uh, was it a male voice? Could you, was it a specific voice or was it more a general feeling of words? I mean, I've never dis experienced this and I'm so curious how you hear it. And I think, I think it, what's important for all of us is it's, it's different for everyone. So I don't think we should get too fixed on there is one way because I think I probably was and that's why I thought, oh, well, it, it, surely it's much more mystical or unusual than this. No, it, it is literally like hearing a male voice in my head. Um, and very, uh, like my, I was 23 at the time, 22 or 23, I can never remember which period of the year it happened in. But it was very specific and it was very old. So, you know, it was like if I had to say it was a human male, 
I would have put him at about 50 or 60 in terms of wisdom and power and gravitas that I didn't have. So that was that was very that was that was my experience. So had you been practicing, you know, uh, silence or going within, looking within, mm-hmm. anything spiritual before? Yeah, I mean, I was okay. definitely I was definitely searching. I was okay. definitely experiencing and exploring many different things. The one two things that I think seem to relate to it. Um, I already had a certain level of intuition that I'd just begun to understand and tap into. So I had an experience where I could take someone's hand, um, and this this happened really, it was a really odd thing to happen really. A friend of mine, we were working at Glastonbury, a music festival in, in England, we were working for Greenpeace. And he said to me one day in the in the cafeteria, he said, will you take my hand and read, he said, read my palm. And so I took his hand and I, you know, I don't know why, we just did it, we just went with it. And he was a good friend. And I didn't know anything about what the lines mean, but I just took his hand and for about 15 minutes I just talked to him. I'd known him about six months. Um, and, uh, and, and he was like, wow, that was really mind-blowing. So of course you go, oh, okay, well. <laughs> you know, I didn't think anything of it. Then people started to find out in the company and, and it would be the case they'd all come to me and go, read my palm. So there was something in me that had an ability to tap in intuitively, but this was different. So that's why, you know, now in my work, there's a difference for me between whether I'm channeling or whether I'm being an energy intuitive, because the energy intuitive for me definitely is, is, is me kind of gathering pieces and fragments about what's in front of me, whether it's an individual or a group. The channeling is something else. And when I channel, um, when I channel through my body it, 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 for others, it, it, it kind of it feels incredibly different and comes from a higher place than my intuitive sense, which is very much using the higher place, but it's horizontal. And to further answer your question, um, I had a book in my house called How to Connect with Your Spiritual Guide. And I'd bought this book, but I hadn't read it. And I have a bit of an experience with books that I've learned that I don't need to read them. If I have them in my presence, that title and the energy of what's in the book being in my environment, I will absorb at least some level of it. It will, it, it's something that you can just kind of tune in on. So I often wonder about that book as well. I think, mm. okay, well, I had that book in my presence. I'd had it for eight months. I obviously had the desire, but I didn't, you know, I didn't, there were other things in my life at the time that I was pushing to make happen and they weren't happening. And this wasn't something I was pushing for and it just popped open. And they have said to me they've been they'd been with me for years and trying to make contact for years, mm-hmm. but I wasn't ready to hear them until that age, which makes sense when I think back on what I was going through before. I guess this is going to be a very technical question, but you know, the, um, Esther Hicks is channeling Abraham and you call... Uh, Disease. Disease? The Z's, yes, the Z's. that's what, so I call them the Z's. Yeah. Okay, uh, and uh, the people I was talking to the other day, they spoke about the source and, you know, this woman that I just published an interview, she ch- channeled Mary Magdalene. All of these different channels, are they in a way <laughs> collaborating? Is this, I mean, the same message or is it different messages from different places of the universe? I think my experience of seeing lots of channelers out there is that the messages are often quite similar or not so much the messages on an information level, but the energy or the experience that you experience through connecting with a higher source. Um, so you, you hear about people who have near-death experiences and they talk about that out-of-body thing that they experience for a while and how it changes them. As a channeler, when you channel, you, you have that out-of-body experience at some level. You can also reach this through meditation or other things that you really focus your energy on widening into energy and away from form. Um, The thing I have come to understand is not long after I started channeling, I was with um, my partner one night who was very into channeling as well and was a channeler and, uh, and basically channeled everything. I mean, I channeled, it was kind of a joke. I channeled Tori Amos, I channeled a cat. I channeled, I can't, we kind of just, we had this evening where, and, and it showed me that you can, you can channel anything. If you want to 
step into the energy of another being and speak from inside their soul, you can do it. Now, of course, it doesn't mean that every single thing that you're... What do you mean? You can channel me if you go uh, into my... If, if I wanted to, yes. If I, if, I, <laughs> if I wanted to do that, I could, I could go inside your energy field and speak from inside there. Now, the, the thing to be clear about is how I might speak about what you're going through might be different to what you're going to speak about what you're going through on a human level but it would be the voice of your soul because channeling is is very soul based it's very energy based it's the big us it has like the little, the the little big, us yeah. yeah the biggest perspective yes and and to to kind of i think you made a really good point are all these people collaborating um are all these channelers and channeled entities collaborating think of you so you're Janneke and you're on earth and you have a signature that no one else has. You're completely unique. There is no other you on this earth right now. There are people who may be similar to you. They may have certain similarities. They might go, that woman feels like she's Janneke's soul family, but she's not Janneke. And it's the same with channels. I've even seen channelers who, you know, lots of, there are what I call the famous channeled entities like Mary Magdalene and like, um, um, Adamus and there are lots of people around the world who will channel the same entity and yet it's so different when you the frequency is different because they're bringing through a different side of that entity because they're individual so in the same way I think that we are humans a collective but we're also individual it's the same with entities and energies beyond physical form there is a universal thread of connection that connects them all but there are specifics and individual strands and signatures that come through. Mm. So the answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know what I, which I think it often is, right, on Earth. Yes, it's like no, just gonna... It's all about where you focus. You can focus on the micro or the macro. Yeah. And they are the same, but they look, sound, and feel different depending on where you're focused. But mm. ultimately, they're all connected. Mm. So... What can you say about, in a way, uh, or give an advice on how to <laughs> live our lives when it comes to, uh, you know, wanting to be happy? Because this is something I'm reflecting on a lot. That, okay, I want to make this happen. I have so many dreams. Am I going to apply the law of attraction here? Or am I going to just let it go and trust that it will come? Or am I going to just work on losing myself? And just being in the moment, not worry about anything or trying to focus on anything, just be. I, I just find that it's difficult to find this balance between doing and being and between focusing on what you want to attract it to you. Mm. And it kind of gets all confusing. I think you've made a really good point. <laughs> I, think, um, I think balance is the key. And I think balance is a learned art. It's not something that someone else can teach you. It, it, we learn what our needs for balance are through our own experience. So the problem with blanket spiritual concepts that I witness is, for example, you could teach 60 people the law of attraction and 60 people are going to interpret the law of attraction in different ways mm -hmm. and 60 people are going to experience the success of law of attraction in different ways depending on how many elements in their life they have opened and how many elements they are currently dealing with that are closed. For example, if you meet a very negative person who is used to um, being negative, usually because they have either been treated in harsh ways by the people in their life or they've had lots of challenges in life and they haven't been able to find light inside themselves yet to, to, to let that negativity open. If you teach that person the law of attraction, they're going to have a really bumpy ride. They're not going to be the kind of person who just manifests immediately, or they might have one quick success to show them it's true. But then what's going to happen is everything inside them that's lower vibration or heavy or difficult is going to raise to the surface because law of attraction is essentially a teaching from a higher plane. So law of attraction happens very effortlessly once you are living in a lighter and brighter place in yourself more of the time. But the reason that we focus on making it happen 
is it's not so much, I think people get, I think people think they're trying to manifest things. I would argue what you're working on is creating the manifestation of a new state in yourself. So for example, you talked about the synchronicity of you with channelers recently. I even laughed when um, Helen spoke to me about connecting the two of us because I said, oh, I just saw one of her videos yes. the other day. On a, uh, so that was, so now five, five years ago for many people, they'd have been like, wow, that's amazing because it was still a confirmation of something that they weren't yet used to being true. But now it's just like, pfft, you know, it's normal. And that's the thing. We're kind of constantly hitting a new normal. So to answer your question more directly, all of the things that you just spoke about are really useful key principles in awakening. But the more you awaken, the less any one of them becomes a linear rule. And if, if I may, the stage you're at in your awakening is you, you're kind of edging into mastery of the self, which is you've studied so many things and you've changed so many elements of yourself. And by focusing for brief periods of time on each of those areas, you'd have these openings. But after a while, you have multiple openings occurring in yourself and you just become a more open person. Then the real challenge is, how do you drive your car, this vehicle, on any given day? So for you, yeah, it feels a bit confusing because I think, A, the world is quite confused right now because we're shifting so quickly from an old way of life, which is on every level, physical, governmental, and then just the amount of people who are awakening their consciousness right now is, is rapidly changing how people interact and experience and feel the world. But for you, that's the empathy of the confusion with the world. Your own personal confusion will come from the fact that you've opened this big candy store in yourself and you don't know which sweet to eat on which day and which one's gonna make you sick and which one's gonna make you feel good. So then the art becomes waiting and going, okay, well, I'm confused. I don't really know what to do. I'm not quite sure where to focus. So what I'll do is I'll sit still and I'll just look at the wall <laughs> and I'll do that for an hour or two and I'll see what happens. And, and my advice is whenever we're confused or there's chaos around and you've got to the state you've got to, stop. Because if you stop and just let everything calm down for a while, you'll then feel a new impulse or a new direction. And we were so driven by our impulses and our doings, and we were taught to behave that way, that when you start to let things flow a bit more, and more importantly, because you've done some of the work that you've done, the way things flow, they're more magnetic. There is more law of attraction going on. There is more synchronicity going on, but you don't have to work at it anymore. Mm. That's an adjustment too, because the old you was trying to make this happen. It's happened. You're in it. It's not quite in a place where you feel fully grounded in it every day, coupled with the amount of chaos in the world. So the best thing you can do is stop and, and, and recognize that it will, it will kind of come into you. And if I may, with you personally, the thing that I feel around you is a lot of options. And a part of you is trying to decide which one, two, or three to choose. And what I would say to you is the best thing you can do when you've got multiple options and you're not quite sure which path to take is really go, I'm not gonna make any decision for a week or for two weeks. You take the pressure off the do it in you so that you let it all sit, but you can keep an intention alive like, I am looking for the highest options for the next six months of my life and for my personal happiness and what I can give to the world. And you surrender it that way. And then it, it's interesting when you, you kind of agree to co-create with the universe in a loose way. So you talk about how you want to feel and the growth path rather than what you want to have and the time you want it in. Then different things will start to come in. So if you were, for example, to do that for one week, you'd be surprised how many things would come in in that week to keep building that direction that you're in. That's interesting. You know, you really inspired me to do that. But then I really want to do it 100%. Really. And that's really. the other, okay, but that's the other part of your mind <laughs> that you're going to have to be okay with, right? Because and we, we all have that. So, you know, the, who's grading you is the question. 
Mm. So, like, how many times do you give yourself a 100% result in everything that you do? Well, I'm trying all the time. Okay, well, then I, the, what I would say to you is, I would say it's unlikely that Janneke gives herself 100% in everything she does. Yet I would argue that there are probably a whole bunch of people out there who look at you and receive so much from you, they go, she's a 100% person. When she's in my life or when I listen to her for a moment, I get 100% from her. So this is why it's really important for us not to grade ourselves. Mm. When you're someone who's striving to do 100%, you're, you're someone who always wants to give your most and do your best. When you know you're that kind of person, it's really helpful to then never try and push yourself harder because your balance will come from trusting that you're always giving 100%. Yeah. Of what you're capable of. So the only reason I picked up on that with you, Yannicka, was because it, it's like I said earlier, if you surrender and go, I'm going to just give myself to universe, I'm a bit confused right now. I know I've been driving the car for a long time and I've been doing it more with you in the last few years, but now I'm really curious. I'm just going to let you drive the car for a while. I think I know what's going to make me happy, but if I'm a bit wrong on that, you can show me something else and I'll listen. I'm not going to make any big decisions for a month, but I'm going to pay close attention to everything that comes into my life and how it makes me feel, and from there I'm going to see where it, where it comes from. Because the key thing in what you were speaking about is the, the energy of frustration and being trapped from not knowing what to choose with all of this confusion around you. And that's why I said, okay, now step back. Because in stepping back, what you do is you disengage from all of these things that are causing a catalytic reaction of anxiety in you. But you also see them clearer. You know, if you think when you step back in a room and you really look at a whole room, you get a big picture of what's going on. But if you're engaged with one person in that room who's kind of frantic, you're picking up on the energy of that person and you're starting to go a bit like this and the energy of the room, you can't really see it. But when you stand back, you can go, oh, this is a really frantic, chaotic room. So anyone I speak to in here is probably gonna be carrying that a bit and the longer I'm in here, I'm gonna get more chaotic. So that's what I mean by when you feel that chaos, trust that chaos and step back. Mm. That's very interesting that you're saying this and thank you so much. Because I, uh, I've started going to a coach, which is really interesting, and I'm going to interview him as well. And we just talked about this uh, at the last time I saw him, to step back. Because my mind is going so fast, and uh, it's just a habit. And I, I think that's the case for most people, that the mind is going so fast. And I wanted to ask you now, for um, it's Christmas time. And uh, we're going to deal with family or meet with family, mm -hmm. you know, and get into those patterns. And uh, and sometimes I can find myself in a situation where we are having a discussion and I would talk about what I do, you know, doing this web series. And then uh, some people might say, well, what about the huge problems in life? You know, this earth is going through so much um uh, bad things, uh, there are wars, um, children are dying. I mean, how does your spirituality help here? And I agree, I all of a sudden don't have anything to say because it's so practical, you know? We need to help them now. You know, we can't just think ourselves uh, through it or uh, share light, or, or can we? I don't know, it just seems so easy to say, well, I'm, you know, thinking about them sending light what is your perspective on this? And yeah. It's a really good question, Janneke, because I think it's one that many people who have spiritual, a spiritual sense of the world or a way of being in the world that would be called spiritual, they deal with this all the time. And um, there are lots of things in what you've said. So the very first thing, when somebody is pushing against you like that, so for example, they're saying, well, that's all very well but um, you know, what about the real problems in the world and war and... Well, first of all, if you think about it, you don't meet many enlightened people who are saying, hey, I've got a great idea, let's bomb another country. You just don't. You know, when you've, when you've met really enlightened people, they tend to be out there nurturing life, 
giving to people, giving to their community. And I'm, I'm not speaking about enlightened gurus exactly, even though you can see that happening as well. So first of all, the more light you become inside yourself and the more you open your love, the less likely you are going to be to A, cause destruction or damage in the world, but B, also you tend to become an advocate against those things, whether it's through what you're saying, whether it's through what you're doing. So those people, I would always ask them the question, if they're accusing you of not solving, I would, I would always go, ah, oh, okay, that's interesting. So what are you doing towards those issues? I'm curious, let me learn from you. And often you'll find they're not doing anything. And some of them will say, well, I'm doing this and that's cool. But the reason I'm pulling up on this is people like to attack spirituality. It's quite ingrained. Um, if you think of witch hunts, you know, we're only, what, four centuries away from that. And these things die hard. I used to defend, you know, like 12 years ago, it'd be that awful thing. They'd be like, oh, you're a channeler, are you? You know, and they'd look at me and I would feel, uh oh, because I would absolutely take their impulse of judgment and the judgment would go into my body and I would immediately go into defense. Now, I'm not very interested in judgment. I, I, I've seen firsthand and experienced how destructive judgment is and it's a disease. You know, it really, it spreads like a virus through us. So you spend many years ridding yourself of self-judgment and judgment towards others. Then you become a lot less tolerant of absorbing fresh judgment from other people. So I think the other thing to talk to them about is, I always talk about this, you know Dr. Um, Emoto's water experiments that he did where he wrote words on the side of water. You can do this with a glass of, of water. People, I've seen this in certain people's homes. They will have like a jug of water and on the side they'll have written love. His experiments revealed that um, words that were very loving, peaceful, things like love and peace, which would help this water become these beautiful mandala balanced symmetrical crystals and words like hate and strong, um, strong energy words, they would fragment the water. It's the same on earth. If, if the earth was full of people who had really active open hearts, war would get harder and harder for the people who want war to carry on with because they would be going against the curve of the, popula of the popularity. So at the moment, people are opening and waking up. And so slowly, there is a rise. That's also why we're seeing this conflict coming up a lot in, in the countries about war at the moment. It's very focused on. So it's a very big topic and a very big argument. But the first thing to do when people are attacking you for your spirituality is to ask them a question back. Mm -hmm. Rather than defend what they're asking you about, you can, you can always go, oh, okay, that's interesting. So, so what would you suggest? And you will find that a lot of those people don't have an answer because they're not expecting, they're expecting you to, now some will, and you might learn something really interesting. The other thing I would say is the truth in what they're accusing you of that they have witnessed in the world is you do often get people who are spiritually ungrounded. So they will be looking for light and love as a way of bypassing what's going on in their own body. And I think the more you follow spirituality, the harder that becomes to avoid. I think the more you choose to open yourself spiritually, you go beyond this belief or that belief and you start to recognize that the only reason you were doing it anyway was to try and access more of yourself and be more present in the world. And, and that's um, it's kind of a, a snowball that just keeps rolling. And what I've witnessed with, I've seen this with lots of people around me and myself included is you do start to get more engaged with the outside world. You can't help it because you can't be that happy on a planet where there is a lot of unhappiness and suffering. And if you've got to a point where you've managed to balance yourself at a certain level, it becomes logical that you go, oh, okay, well, I'm supposed to share this energy as much as I can. And we all have different paths. So for example, you don't know what an interview that you're doing is inspiring someone out there in the world to do. Yes, it might be inspiring some people to send love and light, but it might be inspiring someone else to go, you know what, I've always wanted to be a doctor in war zones and I'm going to do it now. I just watched that interview with Yannicka and that person. We're a chain. Uh, so what about the media then? Because this is something I just made a blog recently where I was talking about that. I think it's important that we speak about, you know, these phenomena that we speak about me metaphysical uh, subjects 
uh, and self-love that we can use the word love in the papers. And it, I got a feeling that, you know, uh, the media don't take it seriously. It's just like, you know, <laughs> we're going to talk about the real stuff. But I'm like, but this is real and mm. it's important. So do you have any advice on, you know, how to uh, shift this focus also in the media? Because I think that's where it also must happen at some point. Yeah, I've actually, it's, I've been lucky to have worked with a few people um, over the years as clients who have come to me and they've, they've spoken about their working in more mainstream media and I've also worked with people in more mainstream corporations and they have a really amazing consciousness and their passion is, is things like they go, I'm going to bring more consciousness into business. I've had a few mentoring uh, clients who, have, who are doing that right now and that's always been very inspiring to me that they're going, they're kind of changing it from within but it's very slow progress. I think the other thing for all of us to focus on is for example, the very thing that you want to see happen in the media you're creating, which is brilliant. Think about it. You're putting these interviews up on YouTube that people are watching. So yes, maybe part of it's fueled by your frustration of what you're seeing in the, the media, but you're using your frustration in a really positive and creative way. And that's really important. The more we can all do that, the more what you start to do is instead of trying to change that thing over there that you don't like, you just create something new over here and gradually time and people's appetites for what's new mm. kind of take care of the rest of the details. Um, but the other thing that you said that's really key, I remember about four years ago, um, I'll have to get this right, I'm trying to get the details right, but I think it was, um, what's the name of the, I think it's MI, is it MI5 in the UK? One of the organizations who are dealing with the security of the United Kingdom, um, they released files about UFOs and they released files about the UFOs that had been had been interacted with, spotted and documented but kept hidden from the public all these years and there was a public statement from one of the officers that this was in the mainstream press in England and he said we apologize that we have been taught and trained to discredit anybody in the news who went on, went to a journalist and spoke about UFOs. So he actually said, and it's, it's recorded, it was in the mainstream press, he said, we were told that if anyone tried to talk about UFOs to the mainstream press, we had to use words like crazy, loony, really? because psychologically they've learned that, you know, people will follow the herd if they're not thinking, if they're asleep. And no one wants to be crazy or associated with the crazy person because they're worried about their own safety if they're asleep. So if you made the person talking about UFOs look crazy, no one was going to believe it. And if it, this, this kind of proves how people blindly followed the media yeah. and just believed what was in that paper. The reason they'd gone on record was, was that, that, you know, that there's been several murmurings that it's kind of unavoidable now, the amount of people who are reporting experiences with UFOs and the fact that there is life on other planets. Mm. It, it's getting to a bit of a melt, a, a critical mass. So some people said, yeah, they're doing it to protect their own backs so that when things come out, they look like they disclosed it several years ago. These are all opinions and you know, you can go into that or not, but it was interesting to see someone talk about how he used the word spin. In media, we are supposed to use spin to spin an article. I think more and more people know this now, so it, it can't not change. Whereas when I was a kid, I believed everything that was in the paper, I believed everything that was on the news. I never thought, huh, why is the newspaper 90% negative? You know, I never sat there, you know, you'd read the newspaper and go, oh my God, the world we're living in is horrific. And then you'd walk down the street and unless you lived in like a real, you know, tough area, which some people do, but not a huge percentage of people, it would look okay. You'd think, oh, this person isn't being murdered and this person, but the reason to keep us fed with all of that is to keep us afraid and small so that we're more mm, compliant to what they wanted us to do. Mm. And we're now at the point where that's really changing. Yeah, because I think people are also becoming aware of the importance of self-love. And yes. I've kind of felt that there has been a shift there too, that before we were saying, oh, that's so egoistic. Mm -hmm. But... I'm talking a lot about it now because I really experienced in myself 
that that's so important because I've been a period in my life where I didn't love myself at all. I was mm -hmm. very depressed, didn't know who I was because if I didn't get a role, who was I then? Mm -hmm. I wasn't worthwhile. Mm -hmm. And then I realized it has nothing to do with those roles and parts. It's about me. So mm -hmm. I started really practicing self-love. And I was wondering, do you think that if everybody came to a stage where they really accepted their whole selves, if that's possible, would they would there be any conflict in the world? I mean, is that some sort of a solution? <laughs> I think what I, what what I've noticed traveling around the world is different cultures have different strengths and weaknesses. And some of the cultures where you do see some of these conflicts, there's a lot of work to be done on heart opening. So, for example, Egypt is a country I visited four times now and spent, spent a few weeks there uh, each time or a couple, two of the trips. And it's interesting because, you know, it has so much potential. But then at the same time, there's a harshness that exists there and there's a real disempowerment of the women as well. So the more imbalances exist within a culture around community and around love and equality, the more we are likely to see war play out. And I'm not just saying that's happening in Egypt. I'm giving one example. You can see it too in Western cultures with subtle judgments. So for example, if you're standing at a train station uh, in, in you know, a country in Europe and you look around, it's, it, it's kind of, if you, if you do this as a test, you don't see a ton of people smiling, laughing, being with each other, being inclusive. If you really pay attention, you see a lot of people who are like this. And they're like looking like this suspiciously, or they're, you know, that you'll see them looking someone up and down. You can tell they're kind of being judgmental about that person. Yet the irony is if you saw these people at home with their community, they wouldn't be like that. They'd be open and they'd be a completely different person. So in Western culture, there is this tendency to close off and I've noticed when I've been particularly um, open or smiley or friendly to certain people in a shop or sometimes, a lot of the time, it's great and you have a nice chat and whatever. Sometimes you can tell people look at you like, oh, what does he want? What does he want from me? Who, why is he so friendly? And I'm like, and, and I only realize what's taking place when I read their reaction. I'm like, oh, oh okay, okay, they weren't, they're not used to that. They're more guarded. They're like, they're suspicious that I could possibly smile at them or, you know, and you see that a lot. So I think all of these things have to be overcome for us to be cohesive and collaborative with each other because mm -hmm. all of those things are divisions and war can only come from division. I do think, I really think the climate in the next 20, 30 years has got to bond us as a human race if we want to survive and if we don't want the earth destroyed. I think that's Is going to... Is there a possibility to, that the earth can be destroyed in your Well, perspective? I think if we, if, we, if we were to carry on the way we are now and to allow certain things like fracking to go on and other destructive forces that a lot of the corporations now are trying to push through and a lot of the public are going, no, 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 with these petitions and these protests. Yes, if we were to allow it to just keep going, there is scientific evidence that the earth can only last so long with the way that we're treating it right now. So for me personally, I, I never worry about those kinds of things in, a, oh God, the earth can, because I, I think that's why we're here and that's the point. And I think humans are very good at adapting. And what we're in at the moment is a kind of control grid that is only possible because people feel disempowered and are looking down like this. That's why the more that you open up to your spirit and go, oh, there is a spirit inside me as well as who I've been told to become. And there is a kind of magic to this universe that if I open up to it and trust it, I can actually find that path. That's where spirituality is important. I don't think it's separate from human life. I think quite the opposite. I think people who are spiritual seekers, when they really kind of do that journey authentically and in a grounded way and they keep transforming, there comes a point when you come back to your life and you want to be more of an activist for love on the planet mm. in whatever way you feel you're the ambassador of that. It might be through ecological action. It might be through working with people. We all have different skills. So I know we're running out of time, but I just want to ask you this uh, question I ask many people again and again. Um, what is your take on f fate and destiny and free will? Mm. It's a really good question because I think it 
it's a big it's a big thing in the world my experience and this is what i've kind of learned through the guides is we have a destined life path that contains certain energetic lessons and experiences for us but that the details around those lessons can be reformed all of the time so for example let's say i was supposed to experience great love by the age of 30 and 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 it was kind of mapped out on my soul destiny i was supposed to if i had blocks to love or parts of me that weren't ready or were scared or would recoil every time something was put in front of me it just keeps recalculating and it goes okay the next the next time we could get it's 32 so now we make it 32 so the details the people the players the events some of them are very programmed so you meet a person and it's like god i've always known this person but one of the things that the guides have said is there are lots of lots of potential soulmates and loves for all of you whether that's partner loves or friends or people that you work with and that things keep recalculating so there isn't a fixed destiny and more importantly i would say for people who've started to wake up the old idea of destiny starts to get a lot looser because you've opened up to a speed of life and many many more options than you ever had before so you do become more of an active co-creator and you can literally say to the universe i am ready to have a fantastic job and by you get, telling the universe you're ready to do that it will bring it to you as quickly as it can within how ready you are so for example you know you might need to go through uh, some self doubt before that fantastic job can land in you so you manifest some little project with somebody that you think oh this could be good and it backfires spectacularly you fall out with the person you come out of it going oh i can't do this job that i thought i could do but it's the perfect purification detox that you needed before the right job comes along and you've gone yeah. through some so of those trust emotions. the process oh god yeah and, <laughs> and and that's not always easy is it i you know our human minds i've had many times in my life where i'm sitting there going oh what's going on <laughs> and then you you know the more i think you go through those things and the more you understand how how life is just this spiral path and you keep spiraling you start to you start to actually be able to trust the process more at the time but i think it's it's not a a snap journey for most of us it's not like just because you know that's how it can be or should be that you can embody that every day no you're working every day to become more of that and some days you're purifying yourself of something and some days you're absorbing a wonderful new level of something it, it's like a you know a pendulum swing mm. thank you so much this was oh, really thank you. profound and fun oh. oh it's lovely to meet you thank yeah. you yeah and welcome to norway you're coming the 7th yes. of january yes um i'm going to be in oslo on the 7th of january doing an event called winter light which um it's a two and a half hour event um with a break in the middle and it's basically going to be focusing on the year ahead and letting go of and integrating the gifts and the learnings of this year just gone mm -hmm. so coming together as a group to really focus some energy on your new year but also kind of taking in what this past year has has done for you so first half will be very much taking in and releasing and moving through and integrating 2014 and second half will be all about opening to the widest 2015 that you can so it will be it will be fun that sounds really wonderful and people can find out about this on your website yes so it's leeharrisenergy.com and if you go to the events page um it's there wonderful well thank you so much lee take care thank have you. a merry merry christmas yeah you too yanaka <laughs> thank you and thank you so much for watching guys much light and merry christmas from yanaka in oslo bye bye